in uh, the fall of 1958. I had been at a, at a house party uh, held by one of my classmates, and we were getting overly friendly, but it was not, I don't, I don't want to imply that there may, that may have been sexual. We were just, you know, dancing close and may have kissed or something, but nothing more than that. And uh, she was uh, going steady with someone else who took exception to my behavior. By the time I got home that night, uh, my father had waited up for me to come home, and it was quite late. It was probably at 2 or 2.30 in the morning. And he, my dad told me, uh, there was a guy here looking for you and described the car that the guy was in, and I knew it was the car driven by this woman's boyfriend. And I said to dad, don't worry about it, you know, it'll, it'll pass, it's nothing. And uh, I lived in, I, I stayed in what would be considered today an in-law apartment aside from the house, uh, separate from, from the main house. So I was in bed in my boxer shorts, and there was a knock on the door. I knew immediately who it was, you know. And I got up and I opened the door, and this guy came in. This was the, the woman's boyfriend. I shut the door, and then we had words, and I, I don't know what those words were, and wouldn't even attempt to paraphrase them, that they were exactly what you might expect that conversation to have been. and. A fight ensued, and I don't remember if I punched him first or he swung at me, whatever, but I punched him and he went down to his knees and when he did, he grabbed a hold of my genitalia and was holding on and uh, just a, a minute amount of panic ran through my body as I began to just start punching his head. And at that moment, the door the main door of that apartment I was in just imploded. I, it wasn't that the door came loose or opened. It came right off the hinges. That door imploded and came right down. And a big man came through that door carrying a knife. Uh, and I could see in that man's face, in his eyes, that man was devoid of an immortal soul. That man was on a, just a different plane than... Uh, it was terrifying just to look at him. I'd never seen him before, never met him. I don't know that I'd ever heard of him at that time. Uh, his name was Arthur Lee Allen. I think it was 62, 1962. Uh, Sandy Pazarella and myself and Ron were renting a house together and uh, Lee paid us a visit one time. He came down and stayed at our place on a couple of occasions and I got to know him well enough to know I didn't like him. And, uh, and I thought he was, he was reckless. When he came in, he made a big entry with uh, knives and guns and uh, what a hoopla. When he wanted attention, he would go to such extremes, like the, the story about the, the bug crawling across the table and him hitting him, trying to hit it with a machete. It would just startle you, scare you. He stuck a big knife into the middle of our kitchen table and got everybody's attention. He told me that he got fired from a teaching job because he carried a magnum under the car seat, of, under the fr front seat of his Austin Healey. And later I found out he was really arrested for, he really was fired for child molestation. He, he was teaching trampoline to those little girls over there and I suspected it had to do with them. He wanted to be a teacher. Um, he liked a children's world. I mean, he, he liked kids. He liked to be a part of that world. Uh, to what extent I didn't appreciate at the time. Uh, he went a little too far with it, obviously. But he enjoyed children, and they loved him. But he admitted to using the screams of a child as a sex toy. Yeah, yes, he did. He used those. As, as he, he said he enjoyed listening to the screams of a child being beaten. 
he told me once that he had been a victim of cryptorchidism uh, in his adolescence, up until his adolescence, and it hadn't, it hadn't been diagnosed or treated until then. The testes are undescended, and what that does, of course, is it, it would uh, postpone uh, the development of male secondary sex characteristics until the testes are surgically brought down into the scrotum. And I think that probably <coughs> was also um, a basis for his feeling of otherness uh, into his early teenage years. Lee liked the attention he got from springboard diving. Um, then, of course, as he got older, that was no longer, you know, a, a possibility. And it, that might have disappointed him a bit, yeah. And then, of course, when he could no longer teach, uh, that, you know, knocked another leg off the stool. His favorite thing was, he liked to talk about, was rat-fucking people, or which we call RF. And, uh, and he had a real uh, strong hatred of authority. He'd get even if, if he thought he'd been slighted or, you know, something wrong. He, he was a very vindictive person. Toski told me these stories uh, about Arthur Lee Allen. And, and I, as you know, the way that came about, I was visiting Toski and I said, I'd read this book on criminology. And they said, you know what? Uh, the guy who really did it will often try to help the police and said, you know, Dave, you've got 2,500 suspects. Did one of them ever try to help you, write you a letter? And Dosky says, yeah, I just got it. And it's from prison and it's from Arthur Lee Allen. He says, I'm sorry it wasn't your man. I wish I could help. And I go, wow, that's certainly promising. Well, uh, eventually, uh, Toski starts talking about this trip to the oil refinery where he'd met Allen. And this had all been initiated by a man named Don Chaney, who was one of Allen's roommates, who was uh, an engineer who'd been in the area and left just before the series of murders had started. Well, it was on that New Year's Day, 1969, when we had this conversation. And I, I never saw him again after that. The first thing we talked about, when I arrived there, uh, he showed me the watch. You know, he'd received it Christmas, and it was in the box uh, with the card, and everything was there. And he asked me what I thought of it. Was it a good watch? He had the attitude that maybe his mother had stiffed him and given him a cheap watch. But the watch was a Zodiac watch, and it had that little symbol on the, on the face. He'd been fired from Valley Springs, and I know that he really sent a lot of resumes to get that job, and he liked it over there. And he got fired, and, and it looked like he wasn't going to teach anymore. And I was concerned about what he was going to do, and I you know, went over there to kind of pep him up and, and talk to him about career choices and that sort of thing, and um, started asking him what he was going to do. And through some conversation, we got up to a point where he was talking about uh, being a professional criminal. And he didn't need a good resume for that. He could do it anyway. He, he said he would give himself a, an identity and write letters to the editors and, and he'd have a name and it would be Zodiac. I told him, I'd, I thought, well, you, you could have a better name than that. And, and he wasn't buying any of that. He was going to be Zodiac. So we got in the car, and he drove me up to um, Blue Rock Springs Country Club. And we drove through the parking lot. He talked earlier when he talked about setting up this random killing situation. He said he knew some places where they parked, and he drove by there and showed me that place. And then after we passed through there, we went back around to Lake Herman Road and, and came in past that site. And we stopped there, and Lee seemed to want to linger there and look at the place. And, and he described what he would like to do to some girl at that place. And it wasn't pretty. 
when I was sitting there at that spot, it kind of kept slipping from future tense into past tense on some of what he was saying to me there. And I began to think maybe this is something that was already history. I went out there at midnight one time, and the thing about Lake Herman Road, it's not just dark, it's pitch dark. This is a country road. I mean, there, there are cows, and, and I'm at, I cannot see my hands, and yet the bullets that were fired by Zodiac had a run or in a circle. Sometime, well, I knew him, uh, he showed me a, a pistol with a, a pin light attached to the barrel with masking tape. And uh, he says, point that at the wall and then look through the sight. And I did, and the, and the spot was in line with the sight. It was, I could see that if you, if you fired it, the bullet would go where that spot was. Arthur Lee Allen, according to his brother Ron, was left-handed when he was born. Uh, back in those days when he was born, he was born in 36, I think. Back in those days when he was born, it was kind of a, a, a scourge to be left-handed, and his mother forced him to write right-handed. Lee was ambidextrous. Um, I never noticed a preference for either hand. Except I do know that uh, he did a single twisting forward one and a half, the way a left-hander would, and his double twister twisted in the right-hand direction, which, you know, to me is an impossible amount of confusion. I can't imagine how he would, how he would accomplish that, but it, it is an indication of a great deal of left-hand, right-hand uh, confusion. I always felt if he was actually the author of those letters, he wrote them with his right hand, you know. And Toski and, and uh, Armstrong from San Francisco Police Department felt the same way. They tried to get him to write um, right-handed when they did the search warrant at the Sonoma trailer, and uh, he just scribbled. He, he claimed he couldn't write with his right hand. Earlier the same day, he used that phrase about picking the little darlings off as they come bouncing off the bus. He was into a rant about um, his feelings about the establishment and about the school system and one thing or another. So that was a part of blowing off steam. Before I left, I, I said to Lee, I said, you really better think about this stuff a long time before you commit yourself to do anything. And he said, it's too late for that. Don came to my office one day and said, you know, I'm really troubled about something that's occurred. I cogitated, I thought about it, and I stewed about it, and eventually I went to the Pomona police and tried to tell somebody there what I thought and that I, you know, that I suspected that Lee was the Zodiac. Don told me that last time he was with Lee, or that he made a statement he was going to kill the kitties they come bouncing off the bus. And then that was the phrase that the Zodiac used. So Don got alarmed and he went to the Pomona police and because he was living in Pomona at the time, filed a report and nothing came of it. The cop was an ideal cop. He was a big, handsome guy and his name was Stone or Granite or Slate or something on that order, maybe Bullet. And uh, he listened to me for a while and, and then I think he just turned it off. Nothing ever happened. So I called the police, policeman in Manhattan Beach, who I knew personally, and he was, said, who do you call in San Francisco? He said he'd look into it. So he got Armstrong, uh, Inspector Armstrong, to uh, come down and give this guy, Don and I, an interview, what we knew about Lee. I didn't have as many details then as I can remember now, but I. I was sure it was Lee. They were going to get a warrant and go to his trailer. And they didn't go to the house simultaneously. And, uh, and I think that was a mistake they made. I really expected something would come of that and something would be done and, and eventually it would, you know, it would hit the news, that arrests and all of that sort of thing. Nothing happened.
I became involved in the case by attrition. The the investigators that no, uh, were handling it uh, retired, passed away, whatever, and I didn't have an intricate knowledge of the case because I was taking it over from somebody else just simply because somebody had to do it. I began really reviewing stuff. I got copies of the affidavits of the reports from uh, for the search warrant of, of San Francisco Police Department, and I read them, and I thought, you know, there was more to Arthur Lee Allman than met the eye. Uh, I, I felt that San Francisco, after they served a search warrant in Sonoma, uh, maybe should have looked at him a little harder. I'm not trying to say anything disparaging about them, but it just seemed like he was more of a viable suspect than they looked at at that time. I was off duty at the time Lee Allen came up as a suspect. I was recovering from surgery. And uh, Inspector Armstrong called and asked me if I wanted to go along on the search warrant when they served the warrant over in Santa Rosa. They served the search warrant, and then he called me later and told me about the results and everything. And the search warrant didn't prove any results. You got to follow the evidence, like in a money case, uh, money laundering. You got to follow the money. Well, in criminal investigation, you got to follow the evidence. You can't, you can't make the guy fit the evidence. You got to make the evidence fit the individual. And in this particular case, it never did. Although he was a, certainly a subject of interest, uh, he fit the general physical description. He uh, had the background. Uh, whether, whether or not I never met the man, he had the killer instinct, uh, I don't know. After I looked at it and, and recontacted Cheney and re-interviewed him, I thought, and he, and he came up with a few more things to add to it, uh, uh, things like uh, Arthur Lee Allen purposely misspelling words, which the Zodiac did in his letters all the time. There were so many circumstances that Cheney talked about Arthur Lee Allen that fit right in with him that I felt that we, we'd better take another look at him. I think maybe he talked about some getting even schemes, like things that, tricks that you could do on people, like, like taking lug nuts off of somebody's wheel. Uh, Kathleen Johns was a woman that was uh, down in, in, in Central California, and she claimed that uh, uh, somebody pulled next to her and said her tire was about to fall off. And then that person took her and her child from her car into their car, drove them around, scared her. She was able to jump out on a freeway overpass or, or entrance lane or something and hide from this person and ultimately went to the Patterson Police Department. And that's when she was there, she saw a picture that was made uh, uh, by the police officers in San Francisco who had ostensibly seen the killer of Paul Stein walking near uh, the Presidio after the killing. And she, she saw this picture that had been made and passed out to other police departments and she immediately pointed to this picture and said, that's the man that abducted me in his car. He told me that what you could do would be to drive up alongside a, some lady. He would never do this to a man. It was always going to be a girl. But, and you'd wave your arms and point at the wheel and tell her to pull over. And when she pulled over, you'd tell her, there's something wrong with your wheel back here. If you got a lug wrench, I'll, I'll take care of it for you. And then he would take the lug, wrench, uh, lug nuts off uh, so that there really would be something wrong with the wheel. Back in 1990, uh, when I had this photo lineup with Arthur Lee Allen, we met with uh, Johns in a Denny's restaurant down in the San Jose area. She was likewise showing the photo lineup and she was unable to pick anybody. She had a boyfriend at the time. She uh, wanted to feel sorry for her, and, and, but that's only my guessing on it. I don't know, it could have been true, but, but I just, something just doesn't feel right about it. Zodiac's willingness to take credit for crimes that were attributed to him, the Bates murder in Riverside, he was willing to take credit for that, even though I'm convinced that he didn't commit that murder. He was willing to take credit for the alleged kidnap of Kathleen Johns, when he, I don't believe that he did that. But those cases were publicized. People theorized that he had committed those crimes, and it served his purpose to take credit for those cases. On that same day, we went out and, and the neighbor was out in his backyard and Lee took me over and introduced me to him. He was a nice old gentleman, old, 80-something. Uh, before we parted with him, 
he said something like, well, I've seen what's going on over there, and uh, he kind of gave Lee a dressing down. Uh, and I didn't know what it was about, but it, Lee was angry. After we went in the house, he told me, I'm going to kill that old man someday. As many have said, if what Don Chaney said is true, Arthur Lee Allen absolutely has to be the Zodiac killer. Yes, I believe Chaney's story. Yeah, I, I, I believe, I wonder sometimes if he's not more involved in the case than he wants to let on. He, he had a, a ball of paraffin to squeeze. And uh, I had been squeezing it earlier, but then I rolled it and and polished it so that there were no fingerprints left on it. And he wanted a fingerprint, so I, I put my thumb on it and pressed it down, my right thumb, and, and then I left. When I went to Washington to, to interview him, uh, the interview, just something, a sixth sense or whatever it may be, didn't feel right. So I, I asked Cheney if he'd take a polygraph. And we went to the Washington State Police and they, and they in Tacoma, and they ran a, we're going to run a polygraph. But he drank too much the night before. He knew he was scheduled for this and was, came in terribly hungover, couldn't take it, then took it later, came back inconclusive, things like that I didn't really care for. And then now I understand lately he's come out and said that he, since the information has come out regarding San Francisco Police Department do, trying to get DNA off stamps that might have been licked by the Zodiac, uh, 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 a Cheney's come out and made mention that uh, that he and Arthur were doing something and Arthur had him licking his stamps. After I came in, he showed me the watch and he was in the process of writing thank you notes and, um, you know, putting, stuffing them in envelopes and that. And he had a box of stationary items on the table that was handy. He says, why don't you stamp some of those envelopes for me? So I did that. He never said that to me. Never, and never said that to any law enforcement that I know of. And I'm wondering if there's a possibility he's trying to cover up if his DNA shows up on any of these stamps. Has anybody ever made any attempt to do a DNA test on Cheney? You know what? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, they've run. Fing we, we 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 took fingerprints, and we we uh, we uh, uh, had handwriting exemplars on them. And neither one of those matched. I met Don Cheney, I think, two or maybe three times. Uh, once uh, a diving trip over to the North Coast. Another time he visited with Lee in Monterey when I was staying at my mother's house. And I really didn't get to know the guy. Um, He made me feel a little uneasy, and I couldn't tell you why. Don Cheney is, is uh, in my opinion, one of these people, he's an engineer and he's intellectually honest. He has a capacity to, to stick with what he knows, and, and I've never known him to lie about anything. Or, and he's still the same person I knew in college. So you have no reason to doubt him? No. No reason at all. I'd like to tell you about a, a, somebody a little different from this, this dark figure, this maniacal killer that, uh, uh, that seems to come across in, in at least a couple of, in the book I was reading uh, just prior to coming down here. It was a bright, interesting guy with a good sense of humor. My mother liked him, my wife liked him, all my kids liked him, but he was not only left-handed literally, but figuratively too. He reminded me, when he was younger at least, of, um, of the young man in uh, Catcher in the Rye. Uh, he, he was well-meaning, screw-up. Uh, he could he could find more ways to to mess up his life 
than anybody I ever met. Why did Arthur Lee Allen become prominent again in 1989? Well, we had a, had a couple of reasons. Uh, primary was that uh, that uh, a guy named Ralph Spinelli came forward, and Ralph Spinelli, I knew him well. He was a uh, uh, about my age, and a small time crook from from Vallejo. In 1967, 68, 69, uh, I owned a couple of nightclubs in Solano County, California, one in Vallejo and one in Fairfield, California. And I owned, uh, I owned a piece of one in Anchorage, Alaska, and I owned, I, you know, I, had, I was busy. Uh, and um, the one in Fairfield, California was, uh, it was a gold mine while it was uh, existed. It was called the Crazy Horse Saloon. Spinelli had uh, various and sundry other problems with law enforcement. And he came forward. It was, and he had, he, had, he had been arrested in '89 or '90 by San, San Jose Police Department and Santa Clara Sheriff's Department for doing armed robberies of restaurants up in in the, in the Santa Clara San Jose area, and uh, was facing I think nine charges of robbery. And he he through his attorney indicated that he could help solve he could solve the Zodiac case. I was also involved in criminal activity at the time and uh, was getting some unfavorable press. Uh, and I, I'm not proud of that. It's just I'm telling you the way, the way it was. One night at the Crazy Horse Saloon, I was in my office and I, uh, the, uh, the guy on the, on the door uh, got me on the intercom into my office said, there's some guy out here who wants to see you. And I'm, yeah, what's he, is he a cop? You know, and no, I don't think so. He's just some guy. I said, okay, tell him I'll be there in a few minutes. And a few minutes later, I went out and uh, the, the guy on the door pointed to the guy that wanted to see me. I went over to him and I said, uh, Ralph Spinelli, you want to see me? He says, yeah, I'm Lee Allen. And I looked at him you know, just blank and help me out here, Lee. Uh, you know, who are you? He reminded me of the incident back in 1958. And I, I had completely forgotten about it. I mean, it, that was just no longer existed in my mind. But, uh, okay, now what? You know, well, can we talk? I want to talk. And so we stepped outside into the parking lot. And, uh, you know, he... Uh, he was, expressed his gratitude that uh, uh, we never filed charges against him in 1958 and uh, how s solid and stand-up guys he thought we were, you know, for not doing that. And he understood where we were coming from. Th those kinds of comments that I thought, oh, okay, this guy's off the wall. I mean, what, what's up? And, uh, okay, Lee, I, you know, I'm really kind of busy. What is it that you want? Well, he, something to the effect, and I, I can only paraphrase now, but certainly the gist of the conversation, and this is what he had to say to me, was uh, I can provide a service for your friends uh, and uh, then take, take the heat off of you guys. And, and what are you uh, talking about? Well, I could, you know, there's things I could do up to and including killing someone. My initial reaction to that was the police had sent him there and that he was wired. In my heart of hearts, I believe Arthur Lee Allen is too smart to do that. Ralph Spinelli was too much of a punk, and, and Arthur Lee Allen would look at him and think, but this guy's going to burn me down the road, you know. Lee said he was going to kill people for money, that he was going to get a contract, and he was, he was going to do a, a murder. He was in discussion with uh, a mafia-type guy that might give him a contract. I said, look, you know, I, you sound like you're Looney Tunes to me. I don't want anything to do with you. Uh, none of my friends want anything to do with you. Uh, don't know you and uh, don't even know if you're capable of such a thing and can't figure out why you're in here proposing this to me. He said, I'm Zodiac. 
and he didn't say, I'm the Zodiac. He said, I'm Zodiac. I can kill these people, and I can kill people and take credit for it. And I said, you must be absolutely insane. And then he said, I will prove I'm telling you the truth. I'll kill someone in San Francisco, and you'll know it's me. He mentioned something like that briefly about um, Agatha Christie book that that had a, a plan in it. And he didn't mention it by name. Later, I read the book, and I recognized Lee's modus operandi in that little book. And it was the ABC murders. It was to do some random killings and place your contract killing in with them so that it looked like it was one of the random killings. After Paul Stein, he came to see me again with, you know, I told you, you believe me now. And my response was, I do believe you now. And now you better really get away from me. And I let it go, and, and that was it. Don Fouts, one of the two officers that were near the scene of the Paul Stein killing. I showed him the photo lineup and ultimately the, the picture of, he wasn't able to identify Arthur Allen. I went to Vallejo Police Department. Mr. Bauer put out a photo spread and it, it gave me the impression that Lee Allen was the person that he thought was the Zodiac. This person outweighed the person that I saw that night by about 100 pounds, I would estimate, just an estimate, which took him out. His face, even though it's round, was too round. I don't recall him showing me a photograph of a profile that he says he did of Arthur Allen, but Zodiac had a widow's peak, hair coming in the center more and receding on both sides of the forehead. I don't know if that's the proper term for it, but that's what my parents used to call it. That was my impression at the time is that it was not Lee Allen. I was never approached about listening to Arthur Allen's voice. Lee Allen didn't sound like him. It does strike me that all of the so-called evidences against Lee seem to be sort of statistical in nature, that if you, if you took a, a million odd people and said, well, let's go looking around and find someone who wears the, an odd zodiac watch who is also spends a lot of time around the water. And, and you keep layering these, you know, you're, you're, you're making a Venn diagram and you got a whole bunch of circles and pretty soon you find that there's a guy in the middle of all those circles. That doesn't constitute evidence beyond the accusation there's nothing but there's nothing of any substance. We have to recognize that you look at enough people and you're going to see all sorts of weird connections that develop. He didn't help things because he played with the investigators and seemed to kind of enjoy being under suspicion. So he would throw out tidbits that would fuel the fire. It's very important, and I think this is something that's been forgotten about in the Zodiac case. It's very important to let the evidence drive the suspects, not the suspects drive the evidence. What I mean by that is we evaluate our suspects by our known reliable physical evidence. We don't then, we don't look at a good suspect that we think, you know, we have a, a personal interest in or, or a particular theory that we've favored and then start to reinterpret the physical evidence. That's not how you do a case. That's gotten a lot of people into trouble in the whole uh, Jack the Ripper. Um, uh, case, one of the most famous unsolved serial murder investigations. And we, we t tend to see now books with very um, uh, titles full of hubris about how, you know, they've solved the case, etc. But actual 
uh, fact, they, they tend to be more textbooks for how not to do a criminal investigation. Um, it's important for any analyst or investigator or profiler detective or, or anyone who is seeking to determine the truth, and let's throw in judges and scientists here too, is to come with it as unbiased as possible, look through all the facts and the data, and make the best determination at the end of the day. But if we made our determination beforehand, the psychological research is very clear. Try as we might, we become locked into circular patterns of thinking, and we keep returning to what we want to think rather than what the evidence suggests that we should think. In cases where you have people coming forward that know a suspect and they are validating the suspicion of that person, it further complicates the case. It further complicates our efforts to either include or exclude that person as the responsible person. And what we've seen over and over again is when we get this suspect that is almost but not quite right, we have a very difficult time typically excluding them from the investigation. So if we're going to evaluate someone like Arthur Leon, we have to consider all the ways he doesn't match the 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 profile of the Zodiac or the evidence um, pointing towards the Zodiac. He's not the kind of person that I believe that committed these kinds of crimes. He's wrong for several reasons. The Zodiac, I believe, was a heterosexual male who was attracted to age-appropriate women. And Mr. Allen, is my understanding, was preferred children, which would exclude him again um, as the perpetrator of these crimes. I think it's also important that Mr. Allen displayed sadistic tendencies, and the Zodiac displayed no sadistic tendencies in these crimes. These crimes were committed very quickly, and I think that that is extremely important distinction between Mr. Allen and the Zodiac. One of the things we knew we had to do down the road was show Mike Peugeot a uh, photo, the photo lineup that I showed all these other people. It, it, to our knowledge, it, he had never seen a photo lineup with Arthur Lee Allen in it. I just thought it was going to be bit bam and I'd be on the way. And so I, I, I had this photo lineup with me and I chatted with him briefly, how you doing and what's going on. And then I gave him what they call the lineup admonishment. The admonishment is, is that I'm going to show you a group of photographs. The responsible that, that shot you on, on July 4th, 1969 may or may not be amongst these group of photos. Merely because I'm showing you pictures, you don't have to pick somebody out. He said he understand, understood. I gave him this set of pictures. He looked at it for about 20 seconds. And he said, pointed to Arthur Lee Allen and said, that's him, that's the man that shot me. I was flabbergasted. I knew we'd have to re-interview him some more, setting up a time when he could come to Vallejo, which ultimately was done. We flew him up and had a, 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 a more in-depth interview up there. And so with that, I was able to write a search warrant that was uh, ultimately signed by a judge. And we searched the house and we found hidden in the basement uh, bombs, completed pipe bombs, uh, uh, formulas for making fuel oil bombs, as the Zodiac had described in, in one of his letters where he was going to blow up school, uh, school buses with little children in them, the same type of bombs, uh, the formulas for making that stuff. He said that he had been visited by someone, uh, an acquaintance, I think from a Tascadero, but I'm not sure, and that that person must have left these bomb makings there, and that that was apparently some sort of a link to the Zodiac killer. We were going to charge him with possession of the explosives and the killing at Blue Ox Springs. We actually had a meeting set up to go to the district attorney's office, and uh, about a week before the meeting, I got a call from a police officer named Terry Barron. I was at home, and uh, he asked me if I was still looking at Arthur Lee Allen as the responsible in the killing on, at Blue Ox Springs of Darlene Farron. I said, yeah. And uh, being a, kind of a smart aleck, uh, the police officer said to me, well, I'm standing in his house and he's laying on the floor. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, yeah, he's on the floor, but he's dead.
They weren't going to even have, have an autopsy because he was under doctor's care. I insisted, and they did do an autopsy, and he died of a heart attack. And that, during that autopsy, is when they were directed by me to take tissue samples for DNA down the road because I, I could foresee DNA becoming prevalent in this case, and that's that's why you have DNA to this day. They actually got the brain fluid, you know, for Martha Leal, and they did a test, and it's a match. These guys are jumping up and down. They're really happy. So while we're sitting there, the, their cell phones ring, and they'd rerun it, and it wasn't a match. But I'm telling you, for about a minute there, I love DNA. I thought this was absolutely great. And you never saw two more crestfallen guys. I mean, they had really been working. Well, they all. I mean, they're guys in Santa Rosa who are convinced Arthur Lee Allen is the Zodiac. They're, uh, I mean, certainly Boward and Conway and Toski and myself and... and Morell, I mean, he certainly, except he couldn't get the handwriting to match, he certainly thought that it was uh, a great possibility. But some really great detectives, and I don't think they're all wrong. He was my friend. I miss him. And I think he was unjustly accused. But I'm not absolutely certain. Let's just say it's nobody we ever heard of. It's some loud in a cabin somewhere. Uh, he's still catchable. It's still solvable. There's still justice. That's, that's out there, this is a chance to, to write the perfect ending, and it's still possible.